Yep. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. This is going to be one heck of an hour that I hope you won't forget soon. We have a few of the people who made yeah, picture of his life here with us today, including uh, the Kalujic family. <laughs> if you're looking at Zoom, please mute yourself if you're not speaking. And uh, the Kalujic family, their uh, window says iPad 71 in parentheses. So Joe Kalujic with the red shirt, if you don't mind, just wave for a minute so people uh, know which one is who doing. just joined him. Okay. Uh, we have uh, Nancy Spielberg here is one of the executive producers. We have Danny Menkin and Jonathan, the creators of the movie. We have Amos Nahum, the hero of the movie. Adam Ravitch, who jumps after him into the ocean, which we still can't understand why. <laughs> and we have the people who designed the music, Christopher and Philip, who is in Italy, and Drew Lahat, the editor. Uh, as you can see, Roger Fishman, Asaf Shaul, all the team that put this uh, movie together. Uh, what we would like to do in the next hour in commemoration of the 50th anniversary of Earth Day is to give each and every person uh, on the panel a chance to give you their view of the movie. We will start with uh, Danny and Drew and Nancy to talk about how this movie came together. We will then move to Amos to speak about his relationship with Adam and how did they film the movie. And towards the end, we'll ask Chris and Philip to share a little bit of the music of the movie. And as you can see, Chris has a piano there right next to him. He can give us a performance that is a once in a lifetime performance. You can only hear it here. And the Kalujic family will share their views of their family living up there in the Canadian Arctic. So we have a lot of content, so let's get started. Danny and Nancy, why don't we start with you? Tell us about how this movie came together and what would you love to share with people who have yeah, watched and, and I would, I would of course and love, watch it later. Yeah, and of course I would love for my uh, wonderful partner, Jonathan, uh, that I actually have started the movie with him and it all started uh, when uh, I met Jonathan after 39 Pounds of Love while we were doing Dolphin Boy, in fact, before Dolphin Boy. And Jonathan was working with uh, Amos and he will be able to tell more about it uh, uh, pretty soon. And it became really our mm -hmm. impossible mission, the labor of love to shoot the picture of his life of Amos. And we didn't want only to shoot the picture of his life, we really wanted to tell his life story. And uh, this became really our mission. Uh, it took us 10 years. Jonathan will be able to talk a little bit more about that. But for us, it's very special. And we knew that when the movie was released, and even though now everything is on pause and it's a new movie, I know people are asking us where we can see it. You will be able to see it very soon when festivals and everything will be back because the president of the United States the state says that everything will be perfect. So we, of course, believe him. But in any event, <laughs> uh, it was uh, Earth Day uh, this week, and it was Jonathan's birthday. And we have celebrated 50 years for Earth Day, and we have celebrated 50 years that uh, not only for uh, Earth Day, but also for, uh, for somebody named Ori Eisen, that will soon will be 50 years old. And I was waiting for Ori Eisen to, to be born, so I will be able to celebrate that. So we have a lot to celebrate uh, about, but we're really celebrating the life of Amos that took the pain that was in his life and transformed it to the positive. And that's something that was very important for Jonathan and I and for the entire team in making this film. So I would love uh, to also uh, have Jonathan continuing uh, telling his point of view. So between the two, two for a moment, don't forget or remember or I remember, that my birthday, the big seven zero, is next week. Wow. Oh. <laughs> because nobody believes because nobody believes you're 17 years old. We wanted to keep it as a secret, but now everybody knows. <laughs> well, it's zero zero seven, it depends how you look at it. But I is the opportunity to say thank you for all of you together. Uh, for for this young boy, my God, <laughs> together with Joe Kalujan as the office. Wow. What a beautiful. And for all of you, help me to come to this place this time in my life and to say thank you on sharing this moment with all of you. So that is incredible gift. That's the best gift I could get. As I said to Joe when I come out of the water, 
is the biggest that I ever got. Oh, wow. Jonathan, tell us how is it to work with Danny and Amos, and which one you think is crazier? <laughs> well, I can, I, can speak about, I can speak about it for hours, um, <laughs> and we have so many, so many people that uh, you know that are here together with us. It's actually, I won't say this is a very exciting moment for for me for Danny. This is the first time we see Joe and uh, the Inuit family, amazing family that we that we spend time with. Um, uh, Joe, I'm sending you a big, big, big hug from Israel and to the whole family. Um, it's been five years since we met him last time, um, and it's and and, and 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 then to see all the other people here uh, from Italy, from the United States, and from all over the world. Uh, uh, share this this really ten years of working on this on this documentary. Um, for me, I, I make documentaries in order to really experience life and to study about the world. And this documentary was a gift for me, um, a gift to work with Amos, which is an amazing human being, a gift to work with Adam, which is a, an unbelievable person to to learn from, and with Roger and Nancy and Ori and Chris and Philip and so many other people that maybe I forgot even someone here. Um, but um, for me, the, the biggest thing is really, and I remember it, I remember the five days that we were there and I will remember it till the rest of my life. Um, it's not something that you forget really fast, real fast. It's, um, it was a, a, a unique opportunity to get close to nature, basically to be immersed by this beauty, amazing beauty, um, and to be with a very small team of people that you trust with your life, and to be guided by the Kalujak family. And I want to mention also that um, two of the Kalujak family members have perished a couple of years ago, and we dedicated the film to their memory, two of them that were with us, um, Patrick and Billy, and we dedicated the film to them, and we will always, always, always remember them. So that's my my take on it, and I'll pass it to to the others. Will somebody have the picture of all the family together and all of us uh, by the end of the creation? If they can screen it on the screen, it would be wonderful. So yeah, I'm Drew, you Drew, you'll probably be able to maybe text it to Chris, and he will be able to upload it. Uh, yeah, I can make it happen. Okay. okay. All right. So Nancy, I will tell you. Your, uh, notes. <laughs> I'll tell you that I met Donnie when I had just finished a film above and beyond, and he had finished on the map, and we were both in film festivals, sort of chasing each other, and we finally met and worked on on the map together, and he started to tell me about Amos and this story, which I thought really was incredible. I mean, it really grabbed me right away on so many levels. But I do have to say that my brother has taught me a couple of things. And one of the first things my brother ever said to me was, Who's never make a movie on the water. Who's your brother? You know, what's his name? What's, what's his name? name? <laughs> <laughs> and after, he, after Jaws was such a disaster in the filming, he said, I'll never, ever make another film on the water. And then, of course, you know, I don't believe my brother. So I thought this this has got to be a good story. And thank God I didn't have to go. Though I really wish I'd met the Kalushiks, but I would have never survived in that kind of environment. It was, it looked brutal and beautiful. So, um, you know, I should get up my courage and attempt something like that. So I attempted it from the safety of uh, an office instead and living it vicariously through all of the filmmakers. Um, I do have to say that I say this to sort of become the joke that uh, the great white shark got such a bad rap after Jaws, and that was like over 40 years ago. So if I can be involved in a project where we can give back to the great white shark and help change that, uh, you know, the bad perception people have about some of these creatures, and I can apologize on behalf of the Spielbergs for giving uh, Bruce, the great white shark, the bad name, that, that is all, that's my duty here. And I also just want to say that even though we are all struggling in this uh, incredibly challenging time, um, but these challenges are what really make us better people, 
is that our earth has actually, it's been better for our world in the last couple of weeks. I mean, I hear air, air quality because we have all stopped driving and polluting as much as, you know, we usually do. Suddenly I heard Los Angeles has really good air quality and that things are really uh, thriving in some way. So w if we gave uh, Mother Earth a little break in our abuse of her, then, um, then that's the good we can pull out of the corona. All right. Nancy, if you don't mind, I'll add one more tidbit. We've done uh, these talks after we showed a movie in film festivals. So for people who have not uh, seen our talk, uh, Q&A after a movie festival, I'll share with you this. When Nancy and I met with Danny to discuss making this movie, uh, I was just asking him, tell me the story, what are you going to do? And then he says, oh, we're going to film in the Canadian Arctic and this guy is going to die with a bear. Just so you know, bear eat people. I'm like, wow, this is crazy enough. I like this project. So they all go on a plane. If you've seen the movie, you see how far they went. And I was joking, they'll never come back. So when they get back after two weeks and say, we got the footage, I'm like, wow, there's a real movie here. Let's, um, you know, go see what it is. And then uh, the naming of the movie, the movie was called Amos for a long time as a temporary title. But back to Nancy's point and the joke is that when you see the movie and all the, the Jewish people who are chasing this bear, instead of calling it Jaws, they should call it Jews. <laughs> <laughs> and right. listen, thank God, Ori, because really, um, and I, I know there's a lot of thank yous, thank yous for everybody here, but Ori, you have the mind to, it, it, the creative mind and the heart that really helps as an executive producer to get these films done. So I love partnering with you. Here's Thank to you. many more films to come. Thank you. Amen. So Amos Nachum, the man, the myth, the legend. I will keep joking that I still don't know how Adam chases you into the water. We know why you do it, but I always ask him, why do you do it? Uh, why don't you give us some of your uh, moments from making this movie and then Adam, you can share because the two of you have been face to face with the bears. Tell us more. And uh, Amos, you need to uh, remember to unmute. <laughs> I'll have a mug because I'm tired of saying it to people on, on Zoom. Go ahead. So Who's going, me or Adam? Yeah, you, you. Tell us about uh, your experiences with the bear. The first experience was about um, 15 years from now when um, I tried to do it earlier in my career. I built my career as a filmmaker or as a photographer, as a still photographer, as, photograph as for still photography still was in its prime on creating images that are involved that create emotion, that is uh, cre driving the, the individual, that other 99% of the population that will not go to the wilderness or to the water to drive them into it. And polar bear was one of them because of Jaws, as Nancy mentioned and as you mentioned. The fact that what happened with Jaws in 74, and then we all was chasing out to many places around the world to take picture of a great white. And the market was saturated. I was looking as a photographer or as a person in a business, you always need a niche or always can create the next step. And for me, it was the opposite of John of uh, the great white in water was the polar bear and how to do it. Well, we went the first time and um, unfortunately a chain of event happened. And when I went to the water, and a safety diver or a second person with me, the idea not to face the polar bear alone, he could not continue because he lost the tank that was attached to his backpack, to the, uh, on, uh, to, the uh, to his um, buoyancy compensator. And he, I stayed alone with the polar bear and I had to make a decision either to swim back to the boat or to go diving. I decide to go diving. And all and behold, despite the fact that I've learned that the polar bear, that other two or three people that were diving with polar bear, or did dive before with polar bear, claim that the polar bear will not dive more than 10 meters or 30 feet for other, their experience. And I also learned that the polar bear 
will have difficulty, very great difficulty, to push below one atmosphere or 10 meter because of the amount of blubber and the fare that actually when it goes in water, it becomes much heavier and, and lighter, we light him up, not heavier, but lighten them up as this fat. So, but it is only two people that told me, or I could read the record that the polar bear will not go more than 10, but there are many more polar bears in the ocean. And my experience working in the wilderness, that always there is subject that are not necessarily operate or behave according to what we people reporting. So I took, as me I took on myself a measurement of what, what else possible can happen. And when I went diving to 40 or 50 feet, and surprisingly, the polar bear was after me even in this depth. And as I continue to go down, he continued to go after me. And I, today I'm laughing, but then I did not laugh. My heart was pumping as fast and I was breathing faster than the regulator can give me air. But till I rest, I came down to about 75, 80 feet and I'm looking up and I only see the paws of the polar bear over my mask almost. And I try to pull back away and away. And eventually it stopped and he start to go up, he puddle in the water another few seconds and slowly start to go up to the surface. I stayed there for another 10 or 15 minutes. My air in the tank almost depleted and I had to get back to the surface. There's no other choice. I look up, I could not see it and I went to the surface. Later on in my career, I met Yoni and when we talked with Yoni and together we went for a few assignments around the world and always coming back to the story about the polar bear, I wanted to go back out again to do it. I did not think about the movie. There was not any, any idea in my mind. But when Yoni, uh, when Yoni worked with me for a year or two, and then eventually I told him, Yoni, you are free to go do whatever you want. You are good enough. You are wonderful, matter of fact. But I told him, if I will be in your age, I guess Yoni was then in the mid thirties. Yoni, correct me if I'm wrong. And I said to him, if I'll be in your age, if I was in your age, I will stay, I'll go into film or video, not stay in stills, because I saw the market in stills goes down. And Yoni did what Yoni did, what he always does. <laughs> Whatever he put himself to do something, he does it probably the best that anybody can for himself and for everybody else around him. And he went to Camera Obscura, he studied um, video. And one day he told me he turned the wheel, he turned the table around to do the movie about the experience. And it took us so long to put it together. However, when put it together and to be back in the water, I told Yoni is only one person I will do it again with. And that is another person that I had a chance to spend an amazing quality time. And it is Adam Ravitch. And Adam for me was an optima of a filmmaker as I am a still photographer, is a movie, is a photo filmmaker, and he did amazing things. And he's been in polar bear before. He took IMAX people to photograph the polar bear. And I told Yoni, he's the man that you, he and I, and you team together, we can make it happen. And we have the result. We're all here together telling the story. Um, Tell us more. I should add, uh, first of all, as almost celebrates his 70th birthday, I turn 35 next week, so I just want to say <laughs> that. Um, I have known almost for probably 35 years, and uh, the reason I follow him wherever he tells me to go is because when I was young, he inspired me, and he told me, wherever I go, you better come too. <laughs> and uh, this project was amazing. I, I have to say, through this project, um, I got to meet Danny and Yoni. And uh, we had a first meeting also at Roger Fishman's house, and I got to meet him for the first time. Um, and uh, I was grateful for that. He took me to Africa, and um, I will never forget that. And um, I remember in those meetings how Danny and Yoni willed themselves to this film. Um, and when almost uh, wanted to go back to uh, film Polar Bears Underwater, uh, as he says that he wanted to work with me to do it, there was really only one person uh, in the entire world that I wanted to work with to, to pull this off, and that was Joe Kaluja. Um, I always say that the, the imagery that we know about the oceans, sure, there's a lot of science out there, but the imagery that we really know about the oceans 
is because of bold individuals like Amos who go into the water with animals we don't know how they'll react and they come back with incredible imagery to share with the world. But behind all of that are um, a remarkable uh, group of people that we have to work with, that we always enlist their help, and those are the guides. And in the Arctic, there is no one uh, better with their knowledge and experience uh, than the Inuit, than the Inuk, the Inuit people. And Joe Kalujuk, I have now known probably for 20 years, and his family. And uh, what's extraordinary about him, I, you know, I can't even believe this technology exists for Joe, because he's a man who grew up um, on the land, um, living nomadically. And uh, back in the 1960s, the Canadian government uh, brought uh, the Inuit people. They, they reached out and helped them come into settlements, but allowed them to retain their culture and their tradition as full-time uh, hunters and survivalists. And I have been in the Arctic since 1990, and I lived through a territory that Canada created. It's called Nunavut. And it's a model <laughs> of uh, indigenous people, like Joe's people, his culture, this Inuit people that through peaceful means and through education, they were educated in the 60s through lawyers that were uh, within their own people, they made a pact, they made a collaboration with Canada to have a new territory called Nunavut, which is called, it means our, our land, our home. And uh, it allowed them to retain the rights of uh, the, their people, their traditions and culture, but also be Canadian citizens. And uh, I have had such a remarkable experience and journey with these people. And it was Joe that took us, almost and us, almost and myself and everyone to this remarkable, I say, paradise in the Arctic, uh, where he knew where there were polar bears uh, swimming in the summertime. And that's how I first found out about where almost and I could possibly go. So I'd like to maybe throw it to Joe, who uh, we're all is so indebted to. For, for who you are and your, and your knowledge and experience. Very much so. Very well said, uh, Adam. Very, very well said. We always, from what they call the unsung heroes behind our performance and filmmaking, standing on a, on a stage, but the people behind, those people in the field, everywhere around the world, in this case, the family of Joe Kaluja. Hey, Joe. We don't want to put you on the spot, but we do want to hear... <laughs> What do you have to say? How was your experience filming Picture of His Life? Uh, thank, <clears throat> thank you very much from the uh, Arctic for Nunavut. We still got a lot of snow outside. It's snowing last night. Lots of cold here yet. So <laughs> I have here uh, my grandchild. He was with the crew in Wade Bay with almost in his film crew. Myself and my partner Nancy, and the Lindell, um, Leo Kalidzak Jr., Joe Kalidzak here. Um, I've been uh, with the polar bears all my life. We even had one pet in the 50s in Southampton Island. But eventually we had to let it go because it was growing too big for that. Family, so we had a pet polar bear in, in our house because. How, how old was the polar bear you had as a pet? How big was it? I don't, I, I don't remember how to take out. I was about four years old. Wow. We had our first pet polar bear. <laughs> <laughs> And I harvested my first polar bear when I was nine years old. And I sold a hide for 60 bucks. I mean, my parents sold it, but sold a pet for 50 bucks in Welco to a school teacher. So we've been, third film crew that we had, and we were really one of the best crews that we ever took to, taking pictures of the polar bears in Wigley Bay. So, I got some health problems, I'm sorry. I forgot things very easy now because of Parkinson's. So, I don't want to dab them anything, but 
life must go on for everybody. So good luck on your adventures here and there. So thank you very much for having us to do the urban shooting with the bay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe. We will never forget you and we wish you great health as soon as possible. One, one story I might be able to tell about Joe is, uh, you know, there's a lot of waiting that goes on in the Arctic. <laughs> and we wait for the weather to get better. And Joe uh, taught me a, a card game, you know, using a, a, you know, a normal deck of cards. And, uh, <laughs> and if you lose, if you, are the, if you lose that game, you have to go stand outside and count to 100, standing on top of an Arctic <laughs> tern, which is a bird with a very sharp needle nose, nest. So you have to stand on top of it, and the mother, of course, uh, defends the nest with the voracity, and you have to put your hands at your side as, it, as the tern flies and tries to peck you in the head. And uh, <laughs> this is how we Sorry pass the time in the Arctic. <laughs> Yeah, and, and we, we had also, you know, something that we like to do when nothing was happening. And that's when uh, there were no bears and we were looking for them to have Joe and Amos singing, the bear w went over uh, the mountain. And then we changed the words to the bear went over to Amos. <laughs> so Joe, if we can ask you and Amos for one time, just for Earth Day, to give us one line of that song. I forgot that auto. I'm not responsible for this. <laughs> Yala, Amos. Three, two, one. The bear, the, the bear was going to Amos. The bear was going to Amos. The bear went to another Amos. To see, to see what he could see, to see what he could see. <laughs> All right, Adam. I was about to tell you there's a game like that on the iPhone. It's called Angry Birds. <laughs> okay, Roger yeah. Fishman. Let's hear uh, some of your uh, memories from uh, making the movie, and then we'll turn to the team post-production to Drew, the editor, and Chris and Philip uh, to share how you weave music into a movie about a man that dares to upset the bear underwater. So Roger, tell us uh, your memories for making this movie. Oh, look, there's, a, there's a, several of them. I'll make them brief. Obviously, I had the pleasure of meeting Donny by accident in Israel. Uh, he told me his very dear friend, Yonatan, was going to be in Los Angeles. So I had the privilege of meeting Yonatan, and then Yonatan said, oh, tomorrow I'm going to see someone who I know very well I'm doing a movie about. His name is Amos, and uh, would you like to come? And I'm like, sure, that'd be great. And I think that day or the next day, uh, I said to Yonatan, I said, oh, do you want to come over? He goes, oh, you know, it's Amos' birthday. So Amos, you may remember you came over. We had some cupcakes for you. Uh, <laughs> And then we talked about, okay, then as things progressed, someone said, oh, look, you know, there's this gentleman, uh, Adam Ravitch, uh, and he has a relationship with, with Amos from the past. And uh, can you start, can we film them, bring them together? And what I remember the most was uh, Amos was at the, the house and uh, we brought Adam over and Amos didn't know Adam was coming. And I remember vividly Adam walking in and it was, it really was this a beautiful, it was both this tremendous friendship, but it was also this mentor-mentee relationship. But when they saw each other, literally, Ashwin jumped over the couch onto Amos, and they hugged because they hadn't seen each other for many, many years. So I think what really struck me was the, uh, the, the emotional connection, the deep relationships that existed amongst uh, all the people, and also how people from all parts of the world came together in a very sort of, uh, organic, natural way. And that was a privilege to be able to meet everybody, to get to work with everybody, uh, and to see it all come to life. So I just want to say that was one of my favorite memories of seeing Adam jump onto uh, Amos's lap. And Amos, of course, being the bear he is, gave him a big hug right back. That was great. Thank you. Thank you for bringing it up, Roger. That's very good, very good story, very good picture you bring back to, to, our, to my life 
and I hope to Adam as well. It is, yeah. thank you for that, beautiful. And I would love to encourage people also to see Rogers Fishman photography and how kind he is to Mother Nature. And especially on a week like that of we're celebrating 50th anniversary for Earth Day, you have to see uh, the wonderful creation of uh, Roger Fishman with his photography. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, it's in rogerfishman.com. And um, it's just beautiful and breathtaking. Thank you very uh, much. Very, very, very much so. World class, but of fact. Thank you very much, Amos, as well. Okay, let's move to the uh, one part before last where we talk about the music of the film and the editing, and then we'll open it up to everybody in this room to ask questions to anybody from the crew and the team that made Picture of His Life. So, Chris, why don't we start with you? Tell us a little bit about the challenge of uh, making music for a movie like this. Oh, well, I was going to say the interesting thing sometimes isn't the music that gets left in, but it's the music that, um, that doesn't make it in. Um, Jonathan and Danny are big fans of, of Neil Young. Um, <coughs> and there were some Neil Young songs that um, I had seen in, in the original mixes. And that, it really, that actually was some of my original inspiration. Um, very simple, almost, um, almost like hymn-like music. Um, and I, um, working with, uh, obviously one of the most delightful things about this project was going to Italy and working with Philippe, doing the final mix on, uh, on the sound. It was great to be there, just creating music on the, so, some music on the fly. Um, and just, it was the first time that I had met Jonathan, so it was wonderful to be with everybody. Um, Philippe can talk about his, um, he's an absolute artist with sound. Um, it's, it's amazing. I don't think if anybody doesn't really think about the sound in movies, they really should. Um, one of the wonderful things about almost every scene is it starts off with the sounds and then the music starts to sort of come out of the sounds. Um, and that's a, it's a, that's a wonderful effect. Uh, Philippe, do you have anything you want to? Yeah, we wanted to make the sound as uh, you, see, you you listen to me. Yes. Yeah. You can you can the, listen. That sound is very good, Philip. <laughs> <laughs> we wanted to make the sound immersive. We wanted to make an experience. Remember your Danny and Jonathan. That's yeah. what uh, our goal was to make the sound very immersive, and to be an experience. And that's what we we did with this movie in the sound, in the atmosphere, but also in the music. So to put the people into this place, wonderful place, the Arctic, and to feel what Amos and, uh, was feeling in, the, in, in this movie. That's what, what, what was our goal. Yeah, and speaking about the music, we, we tried for it to be bittersweet, which is a lot of the elements of what Amos had, you know, with his father, with the army, so, Chris, maybe you'll give us an example for the bittersweetness of the theme yes. of uh, Picture of His Life. Yes, and we wanted to stay away from music that was scary because these, you know, we're not, there's nothing fearful about these, uh, these, these creatures. It's, it's much more, a, there's a much more deep personal connection that, uh, that Amos has. Um, but here's just an example of what sort of became the main theme. The question Chris Gubish is doing Lady Gaga. Yeah. <laughs> the question is how can you get a copy of that to keep it alive besides just the movie? The That's great. I will, you know what? Almost I will record some solo piano versions of the soundtrack because we don't Thank have you. anything. Thank yeah. you very much. 
<laughs> and a special feature of the berries over the mountain. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the remix. Okay, uh, let's open it up to people who are here and who would like to ask questions to anybody on the panel. If you don't mind, so we don't all ask at the same time, type your question in the chat room and uh, we'll moderate them. And if no one has questions, uh, I have prepared a few. <laughs> That's a good start. So Drew, I'm going to start with you. Uh, tell us how much material did you get? Like how many hours of material did you get compared to how much was left in the movie that we are watching? And tell us about your process of cutting things out, adding things in. It must be a torturous uh, process because there's probably so much good material you were handed. So I want to give uh, credit where credit is due. Uh, I believe Martin Singer gets the, uh, uh, the most credit because he is truly the editor of the film. Uh, yes, it's, it's Martin Singer, Tali Goldberg, and Shlomi Shalom. They edited and, and then Drew, you completed it. And I had the honor to work with Drew also on Olsi where he took all of, I mean, you can answer on that aspect. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I, uh, I just uh, had the privilege of, you know, doing little last touches uh, with picture of his life. Uh, I will say that I absolutely get why it was called, uh, why the working title was uh, Amos this whole time. Uh, as a documentary editor, I feel that uh, I have a privilege of, uh, especially with, you know, when the subject is not just a historical figure, uh, of um, giving the respect and treating it in a way that, that really um, showcases and shows the person and not just the nature. Um, this movie is special. It's not just another nature film. It is also about Amos and Amos uh, opened up, uh, you know, to Jonathan and Danny and to, to all of us. And uh, I felt it was finding the balance uh, with the personal story and the, uh, and the nature story. And uh, I'm, I'm happy, you know, that I uh, uh, got a part to take with this because I think it turned to be a beautiful, uh, beautiful balance and a beautiful story. Thank you. The first question we have is, are polar bears in danger or are they an okay species? The polar bears are endangered certain parts of the world, not on all areas of the world where they live, which is only in the high Arctic. By the way, I think that would be very interesting for everybody to know why it called the high, why it called high Arctic and Antarctic. So in Greek, Arctic is polar bear. Antarctic, no polar bear. And from there it comes. And people need to, and because many people ask me or telling me and ask me if there are polar bears in Antarctica or penguins in the high Arctic. Although both of them are ice, but there are different environment in each one of those poles on our planet. So polar bear doing well in Svalbard, Norway, or out of Norway which is international governed by Norway and Russia. They are doing okay in Russia, certain part of Russia and Wrangel Island, but not very well out in Canada uh, or wherever it is, the same thing perhaps in Greenland, where there is very fast um, receding of ice because most of the food or the, the most important element of their food is from the seals, the feeding of the seals which is full of blubber, and seals need ice to make holes, and then the polar bear find them in the holes. When the ice recede, seals continue to survive and swim in the open ocean, but the polar bear are not there. They are not feeding in the ocean. They're feeding either on the ice, catching the seals that make hole, or on the land when they feed on some other aspect like dirt of civilization. There is also issues because, so not just the receding ice, but also hunting and permits, which they're not very clear really how much license is given and how much more are being taken out of the environment. Um, the Inuit have quota, how much they allow to, but there are always unfortunately people that do more than what it is allowed and there is no way to govern it very closely. So the polar bear, because being such an iconic animal in our environment or our culture, there is always 
uh, unbalanced information about their survivability compared to not. They are groups that are care very much about the environment and they will cost what to protect it. And there is others which feel more uh, because there are so many pictures of polar bear and everybody happy to go there. So there is enough polar bear, so why not to deal with it and there is no problem. There, there is all of the wildlife that are in threat in one degree or another. Polar bear are not really in danger, but it is going this way because of the global warming and the receding ice. Adam, maybe you have something to add into it. And of course, if John Kalujak is still with us and hopefully he can tell us what he see out there because he is on the cutting edge. I mean, the only thing is that uh, there's about 19 or 20, they call them subpopulations of polar bears, as uh, almost said. And I think the, the one, it's always the, the one that is the furthest south, which is in the southern part of Hudson Bay, is where it's gotten warmest fastest. And so they're the ones who, um, every year when I first started going to the Arctic, you had about four to five weeks where actually there was an open water season. And now that lasts uh, sometimes two to three months. So that's, you know, a few, another month or two longer before the, when the ice breaks up and before it refreezes that the polar bear doesn't have access uh, to a platform. And they need that platform as leverage to sort of jump off of to capture animals. So, um, and it's, it's the southern population is the most, in the Hudson Bay is the most studied. And so that's where a lot of the data comes from. Okay. Um, our next question, uh, Danny, that's probably for you. Do you have any distribution for this movie, like PBS or movie theaters? So we actually just started the, the movie uh, in the festival circuit uh, in the US. We won six audience awards. We we're very excited. And then something happened in the world. I don't know if you heard about it, but everything stopped. And uh, we're looking forward to resume the festivals. And we are talking now to all the platforms uh, about distributing the film. So stay tuned. We're hoping to uh, give you some good news uh, very soon. And uh, uh, we have our distributor here, Oded Oritz, that will share with you the link to whoever wants to do a screening uh, sometime soon when the uh, festival will resume. Okay. Um, how were the aerial scenes of the polar bear filmed? Jonathan, you want to take that one? Adam. Adam or Jonathan? I, I can take this one, but it's actually uh, the work of Adam Ravich. Um, and you have to understand that flying uh, a drone um, Two minutes after you got out of a dive with a with a polar bear uh, in freezing water and flying the drone from um, from a moving boat uh, in a very strong wind is is probably something that um, maybe one or two people in the world can do and uh, maybe one and he's sitting right there. His name is Adam Ravich, so the question is to him actually. Adam, tell us more. Well, I'll tell you one thing. I mean, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of great uh, drone pilots now that can drone from boats and uh, do it very, very well. Um, I remember one day that we were filming almost uh, in the water as he was waiting as a bear was approaching him, and um, I was on an island uh, with that was about uh, a size of a football field, and literally by the end of that flight, which was about 15, 20 minutes, where we had to get the drone back, uh, the island was now about uh, five foot in radius. Covered. The tide had come up. And so we, and we weren't dressed in dry suits, so we quickly had to have that boat come over. Otherwise, we were going to be underwater with the drone. <laughs> so uh, I think that, but in general, uh, drone shots are so, um, such a necessity for filmmaking now. And um, with, in the old days, we used to put a line item in a budget, like, $10,000, you'd spend that, you know, there were $2,000 an hour for a helicopter, and you'd have five hours to get all your aerials. Uh, now, with the ease of these drones, the technology is so amazing, you can launch it in, you know, seconds after getting it uh, out of its case and get some extraordinary uh, angles and perspectives. And it's so rich to give that reference, uh, especially in the Arctic where everything's 
flat and it's featureless and there's no trees. Need that area. Got it. Okay, just a reminder for anybody, if you're not speaking, please put yourself on mute. Uh, the next question is uh, to Amos. Do you have any other photographic targets that you're still pursuing? Like what are the next uh, works you're working on? I don't know. I mean, that's a very exciting question, a very exciting time in the front of us. Because of the pandemic and the limited amount of travel all over the oceans and pollution, no, no much pollution anymore, I'm planning to do a trip, uh, an expedition, part of fact, or assignment, personal assignment, assignment with three or four other people, maybe to join me, and is going out to where the place called the Costa Rica Dome, or another element, another way to call it is the Blue Well Cafe, or the Ocean Giant Cafe. <laughs> it's actually not a place; it is uh, just by. Uh, it is an area that you can see only from the air, perhaps, where the wind coming from two different directions create a tremendous amount of current for most of the year. But there is two or three times in a year that where the wind is down for three or four days. And because the area is so exposed to wind and so much pressure coming from the bottom of the sea rise to the surface, most of the food, then the ocean giant, which is the blue well, of course, the 30 meter long, and the same well, which is very close in size, coming in and feed, and based on record that uh, mostly from the air, that a tremendous number of wells are there. The other record is that Geographic and BBC and another company have tried the most 10 or 11 years ago to go there, and they've been knocked out because of the wind. I was trying to be smart or try to do something similar to that. I went seven years ago. And also we got knocked out by the wind. So we learned the next time we have to go there like SEAL 6 or SEAL 6 or a commando unit. We go with a small group. We stay on the land or on the water close to shore. And because I had a chance in the past seven years to find out more or less when, it, when this opening of the weather happened or no wind, while still the food up on the surface, and then because we are waiting for the right moment while we're visiting the rainforest and maybe diving along shore with the dolphin, then to take the boat and go out and hopefully for three or four days be able to film um, and to take pictures of this ocean giant when they come in with a big mouth and every time they take four ton of water in their mouth and the, the krill coming out or whatever they can swallow and lunch and hopefully the wind will not be 15 knots, be able to launch some drone at the same time. And now that I also film with video camera, that the new uh, direction in the business. And now I have a red camera with the photographer among us that's listening to us, is with 8K with the uh, Monstro sensor, uh, be able to bring some images that very few, if at all exist from this particular place, since nobody have been there since Geographic and BBC did 11 years ago, and I tried seven years ago, but this would be a time to go there. And because of the corona and because of this pandemic, perhaps there is a good window of opportunity, but we'll not know until we get there. Okay, thank you. Uh, Danny, the next question probably will be for you and Manny Jonathan. Tell us uh, what stories did not make it into the movie? What ended up on the cutting room? <laughs> Why? <laughs> you know what? I, I think there will be a great story that will actually uh, did make it to, to the cutting room, but it's a wonderful opportunity. If we have uh, Leo and Joe with us uh, now, are you guys with us, Joe and Leo? Yeah. 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 yeah they so are. Yeah. they are. Okay. So Joe yeah, and Leo, if you're, if you're with, uh, if, with us, I want you all to see Leo in how much he grew in the last few uh, years and and uh, Chris, if you will be able to play us the moment that uh, Leo is shooting the gun and Amos is speaking to him and Junior, his father, which was with us on the call uh, yesterday when we did the test and said that all of you the regards was with us because 
What so Jonathan and I try to do is also tell the story of generations and the father and son story. So it's beautiful to see uh, Joe and uh, Leo. Leo, how are you doing? I'm good. <laughs> how was it for you, Leo? How was the experience for you, Leo, to be with us? I, I don't really remember much, but it was it was good um that was my first ever trip to go like several miles out from my hometown and i don't really remember much but it was a good fun experience mm -hmm. chris if you're able so maybe you want to remind us the the moment uh, of uh, amos jr and leo in the movie let's see if it works uh, in Zoom to see that. Hello. Hello. I want to provide one for me someday. So. Well, I want to have to worry about him with you. Out hunting alone. Love it. What about it? How was that? <laughs> we saw him. Leo, do you remember that? Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Danny, here's the no? question. How early in the production did the collaboration with the Kalujak family begin? That's something that uh, Jonathan will also be able to uh, elaborate because I'm not used to Jonathan speaking so little. <laughs> and and uh, usually, usually Jonathan calls me when there is like a big big drive. Right now is a lot is a lot of home, but then um, it came uh, actually from uh, Adam Ravich. I mean, we uh, did not know how to how to find a polar bear. Not, neither Jonathan or I. We had to go to Adam Ravich, and for us, going back to Leo story it was the personal story it was a story of generation it was the father and son story which we also had in our previous film dolphin boy uh, but uh, finding the polar bear always jonathan was calling me and saying danny we've never done it i said no we haven't <laughs> <laughs> I, have a, I have a funny a funny story about that because uh we prepared for the shooting for a very long time and um, because I kind of came from the world of um, underwater photography and photojournalism, I was in charge mostly of the production, you know, which was to speak with Adam almost every night for a couple of months and to make sure that we got all the gear that we need um, to go to the Arctic. Uh, that, you know, you need to, to, to get generators and compressors and diving uh, suits and, 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 and tanks and weights and so many things to send to the, to the Arctic. And um, all this time I would, you know, speak with Adam and I tried to kind of update Danny and Danny would tell me, hey, Jonathan, I don't know anything about these kind of things. I don't, you know, you take care of it. And I was angry with him. I told him, Danny, you should know what's going on. And the generator is right now in, in Winnipeg and we need to get it out from, and he was like, Jonathan, I don't deal with it. I'm, I'm just focusing on the story. <laughs> and, he, and then he said, he said, it will be okay. It will be okay. And I'm like, no, uh, we need to do this and this and this. In the end of the day, the end of the story is the last day after we completed this crazy shoot and it succeeded, we got the shot that we wanted. We wait for the airplane to come and pick us pick us up and get us out of this bear island. And I stand next to Danny and he looked at me and he smiled and he says, <laughs> you see, Jonathan, I told you it's going to be all right. A lot of credit also for that mm -hmm. for Amos, you know, and the Kalujak and, and Adam. 
you know, because when we were kind of desperate and Jonathan was, oh my gosh, it's a rainy day, you know, uh, Amos was, t- was telling us, you know, the universe will always provide. And I'm coming from the basketball world and I just had the privilege to interview the guys that created The Last Dance, the movie of uh, Michael Jordan. And, you know, there is something in making a film with people that are coming with their full heart, giving everything they have, and everyone in this project gave everything he could, that we believe that this will end up well. And um, it was still amazing. And Amos, you remember, you were shouting at us. <laughs> the universe is always <laughs> there to provide us. <laughs> it's not over until the fat lady sing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I just want to say that um, when I spoke to Adam, uh, Adam also said all the time that um, uh, his, his, his biggest asset basically is that he knows these people, the Inuit people in the Canadian Arctic and he can work with them. I think this is the most important asset that we had. We, even when, when there were bears in the water, I... only saw them when we got really close with the boat, but Joe could see them minutes before uh, because these people really know the land and we just come as visitors and it was amazing to see how calm they stay. All of them, the Kalujaks and Amos and Adam, they never got um, um, you know, stressed by the fact that the days are passing and we can't get the shot it was always they were always calm and accepting what is happening and sometimes the best things happened to us when it was actually raining and we could go out and walk with Amos in the island and he started to speak about his personal story for the first time so I agree mother nature provides when you're there you just have to connect to it and to understand how small you are and you really have nothing to do against this Amazing Richie, power. I'd like you to, if you can, share how many pitches you have made around the world for how many years before you were able to raise the first funding from the German and the French television and the Israeli television and to go out to do that. The amount of effort you put in and the stamina and determination, it is... I, Well, I do it maybe in nature, but you did in the front of so many people all over the world you traveled on your own to be able to gather to put together the story in the front of the public till eventually we came through. That is another part of story behind the scene that nobody yet knows, only perhaps you me and and your and uh, Danny know the effort that it took you know to get there. Can you put some light on it, please yoni yeah it was it was very difficult to convince people um that we can make this story happen because they basically said we love the story but uh, when you come back alive <laughs> then maybe we can help you with that and I in the beginning wanted to take the risk because um, there is so much uncertainty about this swimming with polar bears so uh, few people have done it before Amos and Amos have tried one time and it didn't work out that well so And he was 65 when he was doing it. So um, people were afraid to support us. Of course, the budget is very big compared to documentary films. Um, but I think that ma- basically when you're making documentaries, it's always a battle between, you know, between the, 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 the negative part in you that tells you that there is no, it's never going to happen. We're never going to make, uh, uh, raise the money for that. Uh, you know, something will happen that it will not work. Um, we will never, we will not find bears. Uh, we will have other troubles, you know, so many negative scenarios were in my head. Uh, and then there's the other part, which is, you know, the hope. And I, I think I was very privileged to work with people with so much experience and people that never lose hope. And um, that's including the Kalujaks, and that's including Adam and, and Amos and all the rest of the team, and Danny, of course. Uh, and kind of, we supported each other. Every time when someone was down, we lifted him up. And, and when you got down, someone lifted you up. That's the way you work in a team. 
Johnny, I want to compliment you because I've seen you from the beginning, from the first time we talked about it, until it turned to be that you become a filmmaker rather than a still photographer. And uh, going through all this period of time I came to Israel and you continue pursuing the story. And then on your own, and together with Danny, in one, level, one time or another, both of you stick with that despite the lack of money, despite the negativity, despite all the lack of success, and I kept pushing, and you stayed with that. So all due respect to both of you, that the determination, and you joined my vision, my dream. It's been going with me all my life, but you've been an integral part, that very important part, and critical one to make it a success. And then other people join us, like the Kalujak family, and we still see Joe out there and Leo. Thank you, guys. And for, of course, Adam with his... Um, creativity and his ability to connect with the Arctic and then together with the team that we see today and for me to see the first time all the team behind the editor and the music directors which is really uplift of the spirit and I will not not to mention Nancy and Ori that have been with us from the side of the the side of the business to make it happen Thank you. Amos, it looks like Joe wants to share some thoughts about the polar bear. And Leo, if we can't hear him well, if you don't mind, just uh, repeat. <laughs> we want to hear his thoughts about the polar bears. Thank you. I guess um, what we wanted to hear was uh, we were here yesterday with the family in Benson with the COVID-19 COVID pandemic going around here in our area, in the world. We broke the law yesterday, bringing some people to our house to watch the movie. So when can we get a hold of uh, this movie that's finished in its entirety? Well, Danny, I think we need to ship uh, the movie to uh, Joe to see. Uh, uh, absolutely. And what I wanted to emphasize to everybody who hears us that uh, the Kalujak family have seen the movie yesterday for the first time. Wow. And uh, maybe, uh, Leo, you want to share with us how it was for you, for Junior, and for um, Joe to see and uh, the entire family. And also, you have seen uh, Billy and Martin that we have lost. Uh, Patrick. 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 Uh, yes, and, and Patrick, I'm sorry, yes. Yeah. It took a lot of people here uh, yesterday. It was the first time we've seen the film, and since my brother and two boys went to the ice. Uh, here, Leo didn't really want to watch it, but he, at the end of the movie, he was really happy that he watched it. And he, wants to, he wants to watch it so well, that's why he came back. You want to say what you thought about it? Just tell me what to do. Um, the movie was good. Um, I don't know what to say. Mm -hmm. You like it? Well, maybe Leo like. Yeah, to, I like it. Maybe Leo like to learn how to dive, and dive will be the next diver with a polar bear. <laughs> 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 uh, we're all it was very emotional yesterday. Okay, uh, Amos, one last question for you. Have you ever published a book of your photographs? Unfortunately, not. And um, I'm only because perhaps I have a PTSD, I have no patience to go over my images and my story <laughs> and my life. But hopefully, somebody will be strong enough to make me stay together and uh, the corona did not do it uh, perhaps something else will happen in my career or that i cannot travel anymore and then i will um, get into doing it i can say that anybody want to watch selection of the work uh, in the next few weeks if you follow me on uh, facebook um, there will be a list of uh, presentation i give online and be about photography and about a lot of images from my my history of 40 years of filming in the wilderness 
um, I'll bring up to light. Okay. Danny, anything you'd like to add? Otherwise, we'll thank everybody for their time, wish them to be healthy, and hopefully we'll see you in the movie theater next time and not on Zoom. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. You know, for us, really, it was a labor of love. And I think uh, Jonathan remembers that when we started this journey, uh, we spoke about the fact that I personally did not care so much about the polar bear. I cared about the people that we worked with. And it is now, and it was then, a, a feeling of a family. And it's most of all, if you watch this film, it's a story of a family. And we were a family uh, behind the scene, and we want, we were, it was a family in front of the camera. So thank you all so much for being part of this. And we can't wait, as Ori said, to see you in the movie theater back soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Roger. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Keep some olive oil for me. Zev and Lily. Bye.